What's going on guys? Back again, we have another episode of Consumed, and on this one, I'm gonna be talking about the biggest nutritional portfolio in the industry. If you guys have followed my YouTube for a while, you guys know I break down a lot of earnings reports. Um, I enjoy that, I enjoy kind of giving you guys some insights, uh, seeing some trends, and helping you guys understand maybe what some of those numbers mean to your business, and kind of taking that information and using it um, and hopefully getting some growth and value out of, of my information. We're gonna be breaking down some, some stuff around Glambia. If you guys are not aware of who Glambia is and you are listening to my content, you're probably one of my personal friends and somebody that's trying to uh, support me, uh, but industry people should know that name extremely well. So I'm gonna break down some things, I'm gonna go over some things, and then I'm gonna give you guys some insights around the US market, and maybe what some of these numbers or some of the strategic kind of uh, footnotes and things that they talked about mean to the industry in the US. Quick kind of overview with Glambia, if you guys are not aware of who they are, or maybe just even the, the vast size of what Glambia actually is globally. They are, this year I think they're gonna probably hit close to like $3 billion in revenue. Um, that's USD um, based on kind of some growth rates and um, their 2017 earnings. That's probably a pretty good number. They are sold in pretty much every country that does kind of buy nutritional supplements or sports nutrition products. So I think it's about 130 of those countries. So they're basically scaled out globally. They have about 6,000 employees globally. Um, so a massively scaled big company. They kind of break off their portfolio into kind of three sections. Um, two of the three sections I tend to kind of only breeze over and not really look at too much. There's one section that's extremely important to kind of the stuff that I do with clients. First kind of section, nutritional, or uh, they call like their nutritionals. And their nutritionals is kind of where they put a lot of their like kind of dairy, cheese, um, kind of operations, uh, contract manufacturing, um, also some of their like ingredient innovation section. I think their US um, cheese and, and dairy kind of operations also fit into there. Um, with Glambia, they do have like dairy, non-dairy. It's not just only dairy um, in terms of like the nutritional section. So, you know, that's kind of where they stick a lot of those things are. Um, the second kind of section I don't like talk a lot about, like kind of their joint ventures. They also have a lot of like cheese, dairy kind of areas in there. Some joint ventures that they have with the different countries and, and a bunch of different things there. Materially, most of that stuff is also probably pretty similar to the nutritional section, uh, but it's not wholly owned. So they break that out into kind of their joint ventures and then kind of the wholly owned stuff's in their nutritional section. And then the one that I cover like kind of the most is uh, the performance nutrition and that's where they have most of their kind of branded products um, that are out in the market um, if you guys are not aware of kind of who those branded products are i'll kind of give you guys a quick rundown biggest one is optimum nutrition um, they also own bsn they also own a long-standing kind of uh, sports nutrition brand called american bodybuilding abb they own isopure they own um, the, a company they just bought last year Ama amazing grass they own think thin and then they also have some kind of like international uh, focused uh, ones. They have uh, Nutramino, which is in kind of like the UK and Scandinavia. And then I think they just bought a direct to consumer kind of website, also kind of like a private label offering um, to integrate a little bit farther overseas. And that one is called, I think, Body and Fit. And that kind of international um, site is kind of mostly focused on the Netherlands, but I'd imagine they're, they're kind of shipping all around um, the European Union. Like I said, um, the performance nutrition sections where I kind of focus most of my attention, so that's where I'm gonna focus on this video. And I'm also gonna kind of focus a lot of times, if I can, on the US and, and some commentary around the US because I think that's where most of um, the people that are watching this is, is probably most interested in. So in the first kind of nine months, and um, I'm gonna kind of have some different cadence with international um, stock uh, reporting. Uh, they are on the uh, London Stock Exchange. I think there's a ticker on the US that's over the counter that you can follow, but uh, there are some different reporting um, elements. I'm not gonna break those down, and honestly, I can't remember those from accounting and everything back in college and in grad school, so um, just bear with me a little bit here. So they did see a growth in revenue of about 4.5%, um, I think about 4.7% in the first nine months. Um, that's kind of coming from about a 6.7% um, volume growth. So they are seeing like a pretty strong volume growth, but there are some offsets of that that 
finally hits revenue. And that's coming from mostly like pricing. Um, and their pricing is essentially um, getting hurt by investment in like reinvestment in the brand, branding, trying to make their uh, brand equity a little bit stronger. Um, they also have some innovation costs that are going on with some new products. And then they're seeing some kind of like foreign exchange headwinds, I think, uh, for the most part. If you guys have followed some of my other ones, I talked about Forex, like the US dollar is very strong. So there's a lot of issues that are getting caused across the global kind of landscape that is being caused by the strengthening of the dollar. So they are seeing some issues in terms of their pricing because of those kind of three areas. There was also kind of like a big um, acquisition in these last couple of months that was with SlimFast. I um, did report on that kind of earlier and on LinkedIn. If you guys are not following me on LinkedIn, definitely make sure you guys do that because I post a ton of useful things on there. Um, my link is below all of my videos, so you guys can definitely um, just click on that, add me, you know, would love to have more followers over there. They're kind of calling this $350 million acquisition of SlimFast, a legacy, long-standing kind of uh, weight management uh, company in the US as something they believe is gonna be pretty valuable to them. They're gonna be able to extract a lot of value out of that acquisition. Um, it has been a name that's been down and it's been acquired several times in the last um, 20, 20 years or so. And at one time it was, I think, purchased for over a billion dollars. So this valuation has been extremely kind of, has been down uh, over the last 20 years. But I think with Glambia acquiring them, they do have a lot of um, great things with synergies and they own a lot of the supply chain. So I think there's the ability for them to definitely get a lot of value out of the SlimFast name. I think they also like the SlimFast name and why they purchased it also because um, it does have a very strong footing in like ready to drink. And then that ready to drink um, and kind of longstanding legacy brand uh, equity is really kind of strong in kind of the food drug mass major um, channels, which Glambia has really been kind of going full force at. Um, over the last year or two. So let's kind of talk about some like strategic things going on at Glambia or just kind of things that I can pull from the report um, or some of the information they put out on uh, with their financial or their management reports or just kind of the earnings call that I thought was kind of important for you guys to learn about. Glambia talks extensively about how competitive the US market is. And I don't think anybody um, is gonna refute that. The market in the US is is the most competitive market. There is so many dynamic changes that are happening. A lot of just hyper um, competitive type of things that are happening, be it uh, lower barriers of entry on um, the marketing side, on the uh, distribution side, on it, uh, just just everything going on, private labels, uh, retailers, you know, you name it. A lot of things are happening that's creating a very, very like competitive market in the US. And Glambia is kind of saying that, hey, we are the biggest uh, dog out there, but we're not insulated from this. This is, this is something that's also gonna affect us. And we need to make sure that we are doing the things we need to do to stay the top dog. And it's easy to pinpoint some little things here and there with a big portfolio like Glambia and say, hey, they're not doing this, they're not doing that. But I'll say out of kind of the the biggest legacy brands that are out there, Glambia is doing a lot of things right and a lot of things that is gonna help them kind of stay um, stay the market leader for a while. What I see like in particular to what they're kind of doing and, and I think it's great to kind of follow kind of some of the things that they're doing because I think it tells a really good picture, especially in the US of what's kind of going on. And if you guys have noticed some of their product offerings lately, it's been really around kind of functional foods and beverages or what they kind of say, ready to eat, and ready to drink um, type of product offering. So though both of those sections are very competitive in the US, they know, hey, we need to have these product offerings out there and we need to um, use those product offerings to get us into kind of like the broader retail landscape in the US and they're really pushing hard for like the food, drug, mass, and convenience, um, club, those types of sections in the US. And they need to have those functional foods and beverages um, to be able to kind of infiltrate those areas in the right way. Because you're not gonna see merchandising for like a two pound protein on a 7-Eleven shelf or you know anything like that. That just doesn't fit the merchandising mix. But 
having a protein bar, having a, um, you know, a carbonated energy drink, having a protein drink, those types of things, ready to drink protein drink, like in the coolers, those types of, those are, those are things those retailers are already trying to look to get more, um, in their, in their kind of healthier for you section. So, uh, this is kind of on trend with what's happening in retail and Glambia is kind of reverse engineering that and kind of working with their product development and making sure that they can get on there. Now, the issue with a lot of those things are that they're usually a little bit lower margin unless it's a extreme volume play. So being that Glambia is kind of new into a lot of these channels, they aren't getting the volumes they need to compete against a Coke or a Pepsi um, or any of these other offerings they have in the similar section. So they are seeing some, um, some price declines, like they said, because of the innovation, because of some of the channel, um, ch like channel diversities, things they're kind of working on. Um, they are seeing that they're probably investing a lot more than what they're talking about with the price declines because they did see some input costs go down from like the dairy market the dairy market year over year has, has been down so they are having a lot more money to kind of invest into these branded products because their input costs are a little bit lower and retail price has not been all all that much different so you the kind of the cost declines are coming from you know, promotional or, or kind of uh, innovation or, or things that are happening that they're kind of uh, having to amateurize over kind of all of all of the individual unit costs. You're seeing a lot of kind of that happening at this point. Um, I think what Glambia is kind of missing on kind of some of the trends that are happening right now, and this is quite honestly because they are a dairy and cheese, cheese kind of area, is that uh, they're not focusing a lot on like plant-based um, and the trends within plant-based. So um, I think they'll probably end up going out and acquiring something probably in the next 12 months to make sure they're getting uh, a good majority of that. Um, the other acquisition that I like a lot that they did over the last year was with Amazing Grass. And I think with superfoods and just greens and wellness and a lot of those things that are happening, um, that's ex extreme high growth. And I think they're gonna get a lot of value out of that. Um, a lot of that acquisition. So I'd like to see them make a very similar acquisition from like a plant-based um, type of play and make sure that they can kind of get that out there. One of these kind of hot, uh, fast paced brands that are out there, take them, buy them and kind of scale them across their, their proven kind of distribution model. Outside of that, I mean, I think they are doing the best they can to offset some of the issues with um, retail. Um, their plays within Amazon, they do have very close ties with Amazon and kind of the secondary player of Walmart. They do some of the contract manufacturing, they do some of the um, uh, private label strategy and things like that. So they are really tied to some of the changes in retail. They are changing some of their formats and things to help some of those new channels. Um, so I, don't, I think they're trying their best to kind of insulate the differences in specialty and the loss of specialty um, that they've kind of leaned on for a long time. Because they're kind of active in acquisitions, they are looking and, and finding you know areas and, and holes that they can kind of exploit uh, I would like to see you know Glambia also kind of do some uh, inside incubator or something that can help them um, build and, and kind of grow small brands from the ground up I've talked about this on several videos of CPG firms needing to do this the issue is that it's just very foreign to them in terms of how they need to do it so they're gonna need to have somebody that has a very um, good idea in terms of like how to create brands quickly and the market changing and what's going on to really make sure that in the, that incubator can really kind of work the way it needs to work. It also needs to be kind of separate without um, some interference from the Glambia kind of risk analysis and, and just kind of win loss um, type of analysis that big portfolios tend to have. All these big kind of portfolio CPG brands, they do have a lot of issues with that because, you know, if it's not a billion dollar brand, they just don't want to kind of put out with it, but they don't understand that they're going to lose by kind of, uh, by a death of a thousand stabbings, I guess you could say, in terms of you know a lot of these digitally native brands coming in and taking small pieces of their market share. Overall, I think Glambia is you know obviously doing a lot of good things. There's a lot of improvements, and, and I can, like I said before in the video, I could point to things, and, and but that really doesn't do anything um, to help you guys. I think that if you guys follow some of the stuff that Glambia is doing, some of the stuff that I put out in this video, I think it would definitely help your brand. But I want to thank you guys for following along this long in this video. Um, hopefully you guys got some value out of it. Make sure you guys are hitting the thumbs up, sharing the video, subscribing, doing all those fun things to help me out and grow my channel a little bit to help more people. But uh, I want to thank you guys again for taking some time out of your day and I'll see you guys on the next one.